Contested Bones, Chapter 11. We've been studying the book uh, by uh, John Sanford and Christopher Roop, Contested Bones. Uh, Roop did most of the work, so he gets the first na a name. Um, it, can, uh, it can be obtained from contestedbones.org, also from Amazon, among other places. Um, the front cover looks like that. Christopher Roop uh, is on the left, John Sanford on the right. Um, we've been partway through, we're in chapter 11 now, and uh, John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of genetic entropy, or what some people would call devolution. Once he started organizing his thoughts around that, he became kind of a short age creationist. Um, but then he had cognitive dissonance with what he had been told was all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes. And he and a young protege of his, Chris Roop, set about to investigate. The result is the book we're studying. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles setting the stage kind of in generalities for the discussions to come. Chapter two discusses the textbook picture which follows Darwin's expectations and that is straight line evolution. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like in some state that the ascent of man cannot be traced. That's evolutionists that say that. Almost all the fossils are contested. Chapter three notes that Neanderthals are essentially human. Chapter four notes that Homo erectus is essentially human. Chapter five notes that Homo floresiensis, or Hobbit, is human. Chapter six notes that Australopithecus afarensis, that's Lucy's kind, is really an ape. The parts that were thought to be human are the parts that are missing. When they're found, they look more ape-like. Chapter seven notes that Ardipithecus ramidus is an ape, another proposed ancestor. Chapter eight notes that Homo habilis is actually a mixture of ape and human bones, what you could call a false taxon. Chapter nine notes that Australopithecus sediba is also a mixture of ape and human bones. Chapter 10 notes that Homo naledi is actually essentially human, as human as the hobbit. And now we're on chapter 11, which is coexistence, Australopithecus and man. And the quote that they give is from paleoanthropologist L Richard Leakey. I would expect that the genus Homo, Homo will eventually be traced into the Pliocene at an age between four and six million years, together with Australopithecus. Given uh, the footprints in Crete, you could say he was prophetic. Extensive coexistence of man and his presumed ancestors. The central premise of human evolutionary theory is that over a period of several million years, the apish australopiths gradually evolved into modern human beings through a series of transitional forms. Intuitively, we understand that ancestors should exist before their descendants. So australopiths should have lived long before the first humans. So what if human bones and stone tools were consistently being found alongside those of the earliest Australopiths? The idea that bones of Australopiths and man would be found in the same bone bed should be, seem incredible. Yet, this is routinely what has been seen. Certainly, we should not expect to find evidence of humans coexisting over significant lengths of time with their Australopithecine ancestors. Still more certainly, we should not expect to find humans and Australopiths buried together in the very same location 
or they would be competing for the same habitat for a prolonged period of time. Most of the major hominin sites consist of jumbled bone beds consist containing diverse taxa, including bones described as distinctly ape-like, bones described as being indistinguishable from those of modern humans, and bones of other African life forms. For instance, in the shallow miner's pit where paleo expert Lee Berger discovered the sediba bones, there were thousands of bones from many diverse African species. These included bones that apparently, uh, that appeared to be fully human, bones that appeared to be australopith, and bones of other animals such as zebra, antelope, and even baboon. Berger described this situation as being the most taxing jigsaw puzzle. Piecing together hominin skeletons from a pile of mixed bones would not be a straightforward task, especially if the bones were just fragments and when there is no way to know ahead of time what a putative new species might look like. And if one had an idea of what this species might look like, and it was incorrect, it would be like trying to put a jigsaw puzzle together with the wrong picture in front of you. Given that bones of multiple species, including Homo, Australopithecus, monkey, baboon, and other primates are frequently found buried together, it is not surprising that paleo experts have often mistakenly assembled partial skeletons that actually include bones that don't even belong within the same species. Such skeletons are actually anatomical chimeras made up of bones of different species. In previous chapters, we have briefly summarized several important instances of this, the chapters on Habilis and Sedipa. Mixed bone beds can lead to artificial ape men constructions. More than this, such beds demonstrate the intimate coexistence of the different hominin types. It is true that, on rare occasions, an ancestor species might split to give rise to two descendant species, one remaining nearly unchanged from the original, the other changing greatly. This is called cladogenesis, as opposed to the traditional straight-line evolution called anagenesis. When this occurs, it is possible for the ancestral population to coexist in time and space with the descendant species. This is easy to understand. Dogs came from wolves, and yet wolves are still around. However, the duration of overlap would usually be short. In deep time, such sister species will not both survive if they remain in the same territory and in the same niche. One will always eventually win out over the other, unless you have a zoo. Paleo experts understand this can be problematic for ancestor descendant theories, particularly where the when the overlap is extensive. It is for this reason Berger and other experts in the field cast doubt on Habilis as an ancestral species to Erectus, and while, why Carl Swisher et al. at one time rejected Erectus as the ancestor to Homo sapiens. They were both in the same place at the same time. Coexistence of ancestor descendants can be more than just problematic. At a certain point, coexistence can falsify a claimed ancestor descendant relationship, figure one, which we'll see shortly. For instance, suppose human bones and sophisticated stone tools are found dating to the time of Lucy. In such a scenario, cladogenesis cannot be invoked. This is because the descendant species cannot possibly live at the same time as its earliest ancestors. As its earliest ancestors. In more familiar terms, we all know that grandparents can coexist with their grandchildren, think cladogenesis, but we also know that grandchildren cannot possibly be as old as, or even older than, their grandparents. Likewise, grandchildren should not commonly coexist with ancestors who were born many generations earlier. I'm sorry. Uh, and you see, if you, have, if you have artifacts in human bones, when you have man, that's easy. If you have artifacts in human bones where you have a common ancestor, unless the common ancestor is also human, you have a problem. In this chapter, we will show examples of two categories of difficulty. One, extensive coexistence of ancestors and descendants in time and space, which greatly reduce the likelihood of cladogenesis as a satisfactory explanation. And two, bones and artifacts of descendant species, or supposed descendant species, Homo sapiens and erectus, that are just as old as their presumed ancestors that is, Lucy's kind, afarensis. The paleo community accepts many examples that fall under category one. Typically, their solution is to invoke cladogenesis. 
Examples that fall under category two are much more interesting because they could potentially falsify reputed ancestor-descendant relationships. Cladogenesis cannot realistically be invoked in this situation. Burial in the same bone bed most clearly demonstrates intimate coexistence. This co consistent pattern of ancestor-descendant mixed bone beds argues against the ape to man story. Extensive coexistence greatly confounds the evolutionary model, however, However, uh, coexistence is a straightforward prediction of our, our alternative model, which we'll get to in chapter 14. Excess, extensive coexistence of all major homotypes outside of Africa. Before we examine the overlap in time of Australopithecus and man, it is useful to examine the extensive overlap of all homo species. All of the major uh, reputed homo species outside of Africa coexisted and apparently interbred. In the previous eight chapters, we've shown that Neanderthal, Erectus, Hobbit, Denisovans, and modern man coexisted extensively. They clearly interacted in interbred. Someday somebody's gonna do some uh, DNA on the Homo naledi, and I would anticipate that they'll find that they have human genes as well. The interbreeding of modern man, Neanderthal, and the Denis Denisovans uh, has been established based on DNA sequence. So modern man coexisted with all of the supposed human pro precursors. Experts describe this interconnected web of homotypes as a large interbreeding metapopulation. This is in keeping with biological species concepts and confirms that all these reputed homotypes really belong to a single variable species, Homo sapiens. What about the newly discovered Naledi bones from South Africa? The bushiness of human diversity seen in Europe and Asia is now being sounded, found in Africa. The latest dating suggests Naledi lived approximately 236 to 335 years ago. Uh, that note does not say, um, by the way, according to them, it has it actually is a reference. Uh, but I think, um, as we'll find out in the next chapter, according to them is probably a fair thing to put in there. This corresponds with the emergence of Homo sapiens in Africa some 300,000 years ago, and that again is in a reference, I think it's 315,000 in, in uh, North Western Africa. Um, and now let he overlaps in time with all the other Homo variants, Erectus, Hobbit, uh, Denisovans, uh, and Neanderthals. Paleo expert John Hawks offers insight into the latest dating of Naledi in a BBC Inside Science broadcast. They're the age of Neanderthals in Europe, they're the age of Denisovans in Asia, they're the age of early modern humans in Africa. They're part of this diversity in the world that's there as our species was originating. This means there is no clear evolutionary progression of the Homo variants such as Naledi becoming Erectus, becoming Neanderthals, and modern man. The extensive coexistence of all the varieties of, of various homotypes is consistent with our alternative model. The rest of this chapter is devoted, devoted to examining evidence supporting the coexistence of Homo sapiens with our reputed non-human ancestors, the Australopiths. This is seen at all of the three major Eastern East African hominin sites, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Tanzania, coexistence of Australopithecus man at Olduvai and Laetoli. Olduvai Gorge is arguably the most important hominin site of all. It contains one of the richest and best preserved archaeological and paleontological records for the study of human evolution. The first scientifically rigorous paleoanthropology research began at this site. Olduvai Gorge is where highly esteemed paleo experts Lewis and Mary Leakey laid down the conceptual framework of the field. They have been credited with documenting the early evolution of man in East Africa, shifting the focus away from East Asia, where man was pre previously believed to have originated. You may remember uh, uh, Java man and Peking man. During, the ex during excavations in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the Leakeys discovered numerous fossils. These include Zinjanthropus boisei, an extinct ape later renamed Australopithecus boisei, or Paranthropus boisei, and other Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecine species. At the same time, they found human bones, including Erectus, and even witnessed the excavation of a complete modern human skeleton. 
In the same stratum, they, found, they also found archaeological evidence for human living sites, which contained an abundance of stone tools, butchered bones, and a windbreak shelter. These archaeological rich layers were described as living floors or communal centers. The eight bones, including Australopithecus boisei and the non-human habilis bones, on this site appear to represent creatures that were hunted, butchered, and eaten by those humans responsible for making the campsites and stone tools. Indeed, this is exactly how the Leakeys described it. Richard Leakey, son of Mary and Louis Leakey, wrote, I see no reason that bands of Homo would not have killed and eaten robust Australopithecines where they, when they could, just as they killed and ate antelopes and other prey animals. That, by the way, is still going on in Africa. Uh, Bushmeat is basically monkey and uh, chimpanzee and not so much gorilla because they're harder to kill, but yeah, if they get a hold of them, they do that too. We agree with the Leakey's observations, but add one key point for clarity. There is no compelling evidence that those bands of Homo were simply, there is compelling evidence that those bands of Homo were simply nomadic tribes of Homo sapiens erectus, not transitional hominin species. The recovered bones at Old Divide Gorge do not reflect an ape to man progression, but rather they show extensive coexistence of Australopithecines, Australopiths, and man. The exposure at Old Divide Gorge is made up of five main series of deposits designated beds one through five. The two lowermost in the series, bed one and two, because they're the first, are more, most relevant to this discussion because they are believed to mark the evolutionary transition from Australopithecus to Homo. Uh, according to potassium argon dating, the conventionally accepted age of bed one is 1.7 to 2.0 million years. It is overlaid by bed, bed two, which is dated 1.5 to 1.7 million years old. Um, obviously, I'm not reading the whole thing, but um, the diverse hominin species have extensive overlap in time. For example, for instance, eight bones, Australopithecus boisei and other Australopithecine bones, uh, OH62, OH3, were dispersed widely throughout both beds. Erectus bones were also found in bed two. Habilis bones were also found in both beds. Remember, habilis is actually a combination of both. All three major hominin taxa were contemporaries. This, fasc this is fascinating because all three species are thought to represent different phases of a single evolving lineage. Here, cladogenesis is conveniently invoked. The uh, Australopithecines are left over. They're not the original ancestors. <coughs> is Erectus absent from bed one? The Leakeys identified isolated human bones in bed one, but they mistakenly att attributed the anatomically human bones in bed one to the pseudo species they named Homo habilis. As we showed in chapter eight, habilis is a wastebasket taxon. Consistently, consisting of scattered and fragmentary remains, which are mostly Australopith, but with some human bones mixed in. Uh, Mary Leakey concluded, and uh, in the note it says in 1979, once you keep that in mind, it seems clear from the evidence at Old Divide that Homo habilis and Homo erectus did not overlap chronologically, and it is possible that they represent two stages in human evolution. Her opinion eventually took hold, and the habilis evolved into erectus narrative became a widely accepted fact and is still taught in, in textbooks and in the popular press. But a lot has changed since she expressed that opinion. In Nature in 2007 uh, mentioned that erectus also lived just north of Old Divai in Kenya approximately 1.9 million years ago. An anatomically human leg bone was found, KNM uh, ER, 1481, which con coincides with the age of bed one at Old Divide. Therefore, the anatomically human bones in bed one, because there's erectus elsewhere, are probably best understood as erectus. So erectus clearly existed in the time frame of both bed one and bed two in East Africa, coexisting intimately and extensively for at least half a million years with its supposed Australopithecine ancestors. When Lewis and Mary Leakey discovered stone tools and artifacts consistent with human activities in bed one, they initially assumed that the toolmaker was the apish zinge, Australopithecus boise, 
A year later, they realized their error and decided that the real toolmaker was Habilis. However, this was their second mistake. The more human-looking bones attributed to Habilis were due to the accidental commingling of Australopith and human bones. The Leakeys had pre presupposed that Erectus had not yet evolved when bone bed one was deposited, which influenced their interpretation. In reality, all those human-looking bones should have been attributed to Erectus, just as many other paleo experts have insisted since the announcement of Habilis in 1964. As noted previously, there is now clear fossil evidence that Erectus Homo sapiens did in fact live during the time of Bed 1 in nearby Kenya. In fact, Bed 1 of Old Delhi Gorge clearly contains the bones of Erectus Homo sapiens. These evidences are discussed next. In 1960, the Leakeys discovered specimen OH8 and OH35 that they initially attributed it to Zinjanthropus and soon after reassigned to Habilis. OH8 is a partial foot a nearly complete set of tarsals and metatarsals, which was excavated from F uh, FLKNN site in bed one, dating to 1.7 million years old. An adducted hallux, remember that's the one that lines up, is not sticking out like the apes are, which means the big toe is in line with the other four, just like one modern humans. Michael Day, in the standard reference work on hominin fossils, Guide to Fossil Man, writes, the presence of an articular facet between the bases of the first and second metatarsals, which means they're not going to move, they're going to be stuck there, demonstrated unequivocally the absence of hallucial divergence, that is opposable great toe, which characterizes non-human primate feet. This feature is unique to modern humans. Evolutionary anatomists Lovejoy and Latimer rightly consider the adducted hallux to be a defining characteristic of human morphology. There is no other species on the planet that has a foot like ours. Specimen OH35 consists of the two bones of the lower leg, the tibia and fibula. Potassium argon dating suggested they were 1.8 million years old. Like OH8, the leg bones were initially mistakenly attributed to Zinge because of their close proximity to the skull. The Lakeys re later reassigned OH35 to Habilis, even though the bones closely resembled Erectus or Homo sapiens. Uh, Randall, and, uh, Randall Sussman and Jack Stern comment agreeing with an early assessment published in Nature, which noted that the specimen in many ways resembles that of Homo sapiens. Indeed, there are fibulae from modern human beings which resemble it almost exactly. However, this interpretation was largely ignored because it did not fit with the ape to man story. The most recent finding of an anatomically modern human bone from Old Divide Gorge was in 2015. Manuel uh, Dominguez Rodrigo et al. discovered a proximal finger bone, OH86, excavated from bed one, that's the oldest bed in the gorge, at, and the same deposit where Zinge and Habilis were found. The researchers reported in, report in Nature the discovery of OH86 suggests that a hominin with a more modern human-like postcranium coexisted with Paranthropus boise and Homo habilis at Old Divai during bed one times. The researchers noted that OH86 is different from the OH7 hand, the defining specimen of habilis. On the basis of several morphological features, OH86 is said to align best with Homo sapiens, not even Homo erectus. The researchers openly confess this, but quickly clarify that this is not possible. According to theory, Homo sapiens are not supposed to have yet evolved. Consequently, they decided the new bone must have belonged to something else, possibly erectus. Collectively, these results led to the lead to the conclusion that OH86 represents a hominin species different from the taxon represented by OH7 and whose closest form affinities are to modern Homo sapiens. However, the geological age of OH86 obviously precludes its assignment to Homo sapiens, and ambiguity su surrounding the existing potential sample of African Homo erectus, in the broad sense, hand bones, also prohibits its confident assignment to that species at this time. It looks human, but it can't be, so it must be something else. Skipping over a little further, human artifacts at Old Divai in the same bed with Australopith bones. We've already discussed in the previous section the 
Presence of anatomically human bones at Olduvai Gorge in the oldest deposit, bed one. In this section, we will focus on the evidence from archaeology that corroborates the presence of cognitively modern humans at Olduvai Gorge long before they are thought to have evolved. There are at least two key pieces of archaeological evidence which support this conclusion. Evidence one is living sites. Expeditions headed by Leakey's in 1950s, 60s, and 70s, as well as recent excavations, have produced a wealth of evidence in indicating cognitively modern human activity at Old Dubai Gorge. Many thousands of stone tools and butchered animal carcasses have been found within these deposits. For instance, a total of 2,500 stone to artifacts and 3,500 large animal fossils were identified in bed one, the same strata where Australopithecines and Erectus, Homo sapiens, wrongly attributed to Abilis, were excavated. Mary Leakey says, at DK there is a stone circle which is the earliest man-made structure known. It is built of loosely piled blocks of lava and measures three and a half to four meters in diameter. It bears a striking similarity to crude stone, stone circles constructed for temporary shelter by present-day nomadic people such as the Turkana in Kenya. The old Dubai structure was most surprising discovery in view of its age, and for a while I was reluctant to believe that the blocks of lava had been artificially arranged in this, into a circle. It can't be. However, the geologists and prehistorians who have since seen the circle are almost unanimous in considering that it is likely to be the work of the early hominids and not a natural feature. To Mary Leakey, finding like this proved conclusively that nearly two million years ago, man had already reached a stage of social structure which included communal centers where groups gathered together, built shelters, and ate food. Now you see why Homo habilis is so nice because you can attribute that to that taxon. If it's not really, then all of a sudden you have to figure out what's going on. Henry Bunn has a comment, another researcher at Olduvai, which founded the Olduvai Paleoanthropology and Paleoecology Project. In 2006, cited evidence from Bed One that um, indicates that the occupants at Olduvai acquired large prey by active hunting and not merely as passive scavengers. High density bone assemblages reveal repeated carcass transport to the same location where they were butchered. The transported carcasses included large animals such as hippo, wild beast, and antelope. All of this is further confirmation that the occupants of Old Divide were fully human, even in the oldest strata. Evidence two is manufactured stone tools. The existence of stone tools alone unequivocally demonstrates humans must have been around at the time bed one and bed two were deposited, 1.15 to 2 million years ago, according to the standard dating methods. The Leakeys mistakenly attributed these stone tools first to the extinct ape Zinge, because it's the only thing they could see, and then a few later to Habilis. However, it now appears they were made by man. The man-like part of Habilis, if you like. The types of stone tools found at Olduvai are diverse. A common tool found in bed two is a small quartzite awl with a sharpened point. Mary Leakey notes, uh, the work says leaky, but there are three leaky, so. In more recent prehistoric times, such tools must have been used, uh, such tools have been used for working leather. The level of cognition needed to carefully select a specific rock type that can be shaped, shaped through a flaking process to serve a specific purpose has never been seen in apes. An article, in an article published in Nature, uh, Sonia Harmon et al. explained that the manufacturing, uh, manufacture of the stone tools at Old Divai require understanding of the stone's fracture properties, planning, manual dexterity, and raw material selectivity. Just not the kind of thing you see chimpanzees doing. What's more striking is that there is a modern human skeleton in bed two at Old Divai Gorge. That's one, how many of you have heard of that before? Ariel Roth has. Not too many. This is not broadcast, but it's there. In the sections above, we have shown that, the th that three major hominin taxa 
traditionally believed to represent ancestor-descendant relationships, coexisted in the fossil record in the oldest strata of the Old Divide Gorge. Australopiths, the Chimeric Habilis, and Erectus have all been found buried together in the same, very same strata, beds one and two. Yet there's one particular finding at Old Divide Gorge that's even more surprising. Finding a specimen OH1. That's the very first specimen, which uh, was the first hominin found at Old, Old, Old Divide Gorge. It is universally agreed to be an anatomically modern human, but was excavated from bed two where Australopithecus and Erectus bones were also found. German paleontologist Hans Reck was the first scientist to study the geology at Old Divide. He embarked on his first expedition in 1913, that's before World War I, where uh, I think German, this is German East Africa actually originally, where he conducted extensive research cataloging numerous fossils and meticulously detailing the geology. Reck identified the five main de depositional sequences that make up Old Divide Gorge, that's beds one through five, a system that is still used by geologists today. He's a good man. He was also credited with finding the first fossil hominin, designated OH1, a nearly modern, complete s human skeleton. Here's a photo of Hans Reck. Um, and there is the skeleton. Take a look at it. You will notice that there are no heavy brow ridges, that the forehead goes up straight, that the cranial capacity appears to be approach modern. Obviously, these, the uh, cranium has been partly stove in, so that, uh, uh, you know, there's been some post-death damage, but, or maybe pre-death damage, maybe that's how he died, I don't know, but. Um, and you can see also very clearly the human-like feet. Yes. So, um, is it possible that layers through erosion are, ex are ex uh, exposed? so that this is not deep down, but it's on the surface, and that people later dug into an older layer and then buried somebody. It is theoretically possible. We're gonna go into the archeology span of this. That is a good question. But what I want you to notice, first of all, is that this is as modern as you could possibly ask for. The provocative findings stirred up immense controversy among the paleoanthropology community of his time. Today, Rex's finding has been swept aside and ignored, but not for any sound scientific reason, apart from commitment to the eight to man paradigm. Yet, Rex and this skeleton very literally represent the beginning of modern paleoanthropology. It was many years prior to the discovery of Zinge and Habilis when Rex found the first human bones from Old Divide Gorge nicknamed Oldaway Old Man. The skeleton was, very near, was nearly complete and unquestionably modern in its anatomy. It was excavated from bed two, making it the oldest dis discovery of a modern Homo sapiens. Rec reported his find and invited Lewis Leakey to visit the Old site. At first, Leakey was skeptical about Rec's find until 1931 when he collaborated, um, looks like there's a misspelling, it should be an A, with him in Tanzania and examined the finding firsthand. Leakey was then convinced that Old Away Man was authentic. How convinced was he? But this was an unwelcome find for most paleoanthropologists who did not accept the possibility of such an early date for the origin of man, 1.5 to 1.7 million years old, according to the current potassium argon dates for bed two. This is significantly older than the oldest currently accepted Homo sapiens fossil, a jawbone that dates 315 years old, was recently found at Jebel Irhud, Morocco on, of Northern Africa. And remember, that was just found this year, so, or actually last year now. Um, so, uh, 
before that it was even more modern than that, except for this clearly modern Homo sapiens. Many who, uh, who nev had never directly examined the excavation site put heavy pressure on Leakey to recant his position. They argued that it must have been an intrusive grave dug into bed too. Your question, I think, exactly. In recent history, rather than an in situ burial at the time of deposition, Leakey, Reck, and a number of other researchers adamantly disagreed and expertly defended the find. Those of you who have the book will be able to look up the reference. And the reference in the book is Reck, H, Boswell, PGH, and so forth. I thought that was an unusual omission, and I went back, and if you go, uh, if you go to Google Scholar and find the, uh, find the older way human skeleton nature, you will find that actually the first author is Leakey LSB. Why they omitted that, I don't know. It may have been that they just copied the... Uh, uh, the article from th there's one place where it where Leakey got chopped off um, uh, probably an artifact of some kind and and he may have copied it from that I don't know but I can tell you that the original has Leakey's name on it those who had actually seen and carefully analyzed the site firsthand made numerous observations demonstrating that Old Hawaii man could not have been an intrusive burial. Rec, who understood the geology in Old Hawaii better than anyone, noted, the bed in which the human remains were found showed no signs of disturbance. The spot appeared exactly like any other in the horizon. There was no evidence of any refilled hole or grave. He further stated, Sediment is so constituted that the artificial breaking of the bed with its visible layering by digging of a grave would necessarily be recognizable. The wall of the grave should, would show in profile a division from the undisturbed stone. The grave filling would show an abnormal structure and heterogeneous mixture, mixture of excavated material, including easily recognizable pieces of calcrete. Um, that's kind of natural concrete. Neither of these signs were to be found despite the most attentive inspection. They were looking for your exact question. Rather than the, rather the stone directly above the skeleton was not distinguishable from the neighboring stones in terms of ha color, hardness, thickness of layer, structure, or order. Among the many scientists who accepted the legitimacy of their findings was American anthropologist George Grant McCurdy of Yale University. He wrote in Science saying, the skeleton was found some three to four meters below the rim of the Old Divide Gorge, which is here about 50 meters deep. The skeleton bore the same relation to the stratified bed as did the other mammalian remains and was dug out of hard clay tuff with hammer and chisel just as these were. In other words, the conditions of the find were such as to exclude the possibility of an interment a recent grave burial. The human bones are therefore as old as the deposit. So if you go by the evidence you actually see as opposed to what your theory says, this guy was uh, in the neighborhood of 1.7 million years old. Although there was no valid evidence against its authenticity, scientific politics won the day. Lewis Leakey eventually yielded to the demands of the senior members of the paleo community to dismiss the findings, as those hostile to his position were reviewing his latest submitted papers. Since then, Old Hawaii Man has been largely forgotten. If mentioned at all, it is safely listed as an intrusive burial. But the early debate about Old Divine Man is well documented in a series of science papers. This is just one more example of fiercely contested bones and the unceasing effort to force the data to conform to the ape to man narrative. We will review this history and its implications elsewhere. Uh, homo bones from Laetoli predate the oldest ho homo bones from Old Divine. In Laetoli, Tanzania, just 30 miles away from Old Divine Gorge, Mary Leakey discovered jawbones and teeth from at least 13 individuals. The specimens were situated in volcanic aft ash tufts that were potassium argon dated as 3.7 million years old. 
She, along with Tim White and other colleagues, published their findings in Nature in 1976. In their paper, all the bones were attributed to the genus Homo without any qualification. One of those specimens was a jawbone, LH4, that would later be reclassified and used as, a defining, or as part of the defining specimen for Johansson's new species, Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy's kind. Mary was vehemently opposed to Johansson and White's decision to reclassify her bones. She was convinced her Laetoli sample belonged in the human genus, which we'll discuss more. During the same year of her publication in Nature, Mary found another remarkable discovery that further, further confirmed the presence of humans at the Laetoli site. The Laetoli G footprints appear to have been made by three individuals, one of whom was smaller, walking in the footprints of another, traveling in the same direction in close proximity. The fossilized footprints were dated as being 3.7 million years old, same age as the homo bones. The findings were published in Nature, 1979. Some of you may remember those. Moving on a little bit, I'm gonna tell you this, this area, I'm skipping over some pieces of it. If you have the book, read it, it's fascinating. The Laetoli footprints would have resulted in a comprehensive re-examination of the ape to man story if it had not been for John Donald Johansson and Tim White. They subsequently reclassified all of Mary Leakey's homo fossils, assigning them to Johansson's reputed new species, Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy's kind, from Hadara, Ethiopia. The human looking footprints were also credited to Lucy's kind. This is extraordinary because no Australopith bones were associated with the footprints, nor has any Australopith skeleton been found with anatomically human feet. Yet Homo bones were found very near the footprints. So why not Homo? Well, because it can't be. This largely untold story of intrigue and politics is discussed further in the next section on the Ethiopia findings. The single event assigning the Laetoli homo bones and the Laetoli footprints to Lucy's kind is remarkable in that it reflects a major turning point in the field of paleoanthropology. It also reflects what looks to be an unprecedented example of showmanship, manipulation, and scientific politics. Latest findings confirm the coexistence of Australopith and man in Tanzania. In 2015, a dozen additional footprints were found less than 500 feet south of site G where the Laetoli footprints were found. The newly found trackway is designated as Site S. The footprints belong to two individuals who walked on the same surface and in the same direction as the G footprints discovered 40 years earlier by Mary Leakey. The average foot length of the larger individual, SI, was 10.28 inches. Had the individual lived today, he could have worn a size 11 shoe and stood over six feet tall. By the way, just for comparison, my shoe size is nine and a half. Paleo experts have nicknamed the larger individual Chewy after the Star Wars character. Chewy's footprints are human in size, shape, and gait. The new finding makes it even more incredible to claim that they were formed by Lucy's kind, Afarensis. Not surprisingly, many paleo experts have found this interpretation to be unconvincing at best. Therefore, Afarensis cannot be accepted as a sexually dimor dimorphic species with the males being big and the females being small, and the males looking human and the females looking ape. The um, larger anatomically distinct bones apparently belong to an entirely separate species and likely a separate genus. This is actually what Johansson had originally reported in Nature. He was convinced that there were two or more species from separate genera, Homo and Australopithecus, represented in his Hadar collection of bones. We'll talk about that next. Ethiopia, that's, this is Hadar region. Extensive coexistence of Australopith and man at a far region. The famous Lucy ape man shown in museums in textbooks consists of a single skeleton that belongs to the reputed species Australopithecus afarensis. Donald Johansson discovered the 3.2 million year old partial skeleton in 1974 from the Afar region in Ethiopia. While most of us have heard of Lucy, very few, few people know that Donald Johansson found far more than Lucy during his expeditions in the 70s. 
His team found 300 additional bones across the Afar landscape, mostly isolated fragmentary, fragmentary remains. All of those bones are now described as Lucy's kind, but this is not what Johansson initially claimed. To understand the full story about her species and how Lucy and Johansson became famous, we need to discuss those additional bones that made up the bulk of the fossil material found in Hadar that are called Afarensis. The site where Lucy and her kind were discovered, the Hadar region of Ethiopia, contained many bones that were initially classified as homo, or human, by none other than the discovery of Lucy, Donald Johansson. There is compelling evidence that the collection of bones generally assumed to belong to Afarensis includes bones from our own genus Homo. Donald Johansson and Mary Leakey originally agreed that the Laetoli collection, remember this is where the footprints are, consisted of Homo bones and that the Hadar sample contained a mixture of Homo and Australopithecus. In Laetoli, Mary Leakey found homo-looking jawbones and modern human-looking fo fossilized footprints. She reported her findings in Nature, 1976 and 1979, and assigned her bones to the genus Homo. Probably Homo habilis is my guess. Meanwhile, Johansson's growing collection of bones from various sites in Hadar displayed mixed anatomies. Johansson himself and his colleague originally reported in his announcement paper in Science that his Hadar samples consisted of both Homo and Australopithecus bones. The collection suggests that Homo and Australopithecus coexisted as early as three million years ago. Think about that. Johansson recounts, I was convinced that there were two species at Hadar. The bones, human and Australopith, found in Hadar all dated between three and four million years ago the oldest homo bones ever found. Despite multiple confirmations of homo bones at both sites, Johansson later decided to reclassify the entire Hadar Laetoli collection of bones, including Mary Leakey's bones, which she had already ported in nature as homo, as a single highly variable species, Australopithecus afarensis. In a single stroke, all those anatomically human-looking fossils from Hadar and Eleatoli, which were originally classified as Homo, were arbitrarily assigned to Lucy's kind, Australopithecus afarensis. The larger bones originally assigned to the human genus were explained away as being merely due to physical difference between the males and females of the same species, or sexual dimorphism, which we read about earlier. Skipping over Mary Leakey and Johansson, this is actually good, but uh, unfortunately I don't have time to read it all, had agreed that at each of their sites they were seeing mixed bone beds with os both Australopiths and human bones. When Johansson changed his story to put his Lucy as the center, Mary Leakey expressed very strong scientific opposition and even personal anger for having her homo fossils assigned to his new species. By the way, that should be green, it's mine. Uh, Johnson, Mary Leakey, and Tim White, who was working with Mary and Leotoli, had originally agreed to publish a joint paper in Science describing their findings. They planned to publish how they found Homo and the Australopith bones at Hadar and Leotoli dating to three, point, three to four million years ago. However, this is not what happened. Little did Mary know that behind the scenes, Johansson and White had decided to rename all of the aforementioned fossils from Hadar and Leotoli to a single new species, that is, Lucy's kind. Johansson even reclassified a homo jawbone, LH4, found in, by Mary in Laetoli as the defining specimen, or part of the defining specimen, for his new species, Australopithecus afarensis. The joint paper published in Science was just coming out when Johansson announced at a paleoanthropology meeting in Calgary that he had discovered a new hominin species. Johansson didn't seem to realize that Mary was sitting in the audience to hear his unexpected announcement or betrayal. She was livid and demanded that John Johansson and White remove her name from the joint paper. She adamantly agreed with Johansson and White's decision to combine the Hadar Laetoli sample into a single new Australopithecine species. To marry her Laetoli sample, as well as Johansson and Hadar collection, certainly included homo bones, as they'd all initially agreed and as they'd all separately reported in Nature. Renaming all the bones from Hadar and Laetoli, including the bones that Johnson originally insisted were clearly human, was undoubtedly a strategic move. Johnson and White understood that by reassigning all the human bones to their, uh, their new species, Australopithecus afarensis, they could then promote their finding as an early human ancestor, an ancestor to all later hominins. 
This was just what they reported in their 1979 science paper that was reprinted without Mary's name. This very strategic move instantly catapulted Johansson into the limelight along with his newly famous Lucy skeleton as the reputed ancestor of us all. Skipping over about 12 very interesting but uh, not central uh, paragraphs. The latest findings confirm the coexistence of Australopithecus and man at Ethiopia. In 2010, bones displaying slice marks, which would require tools, were found in the Hadar region. This is further evidence for the presence of humans during the time of Lucy and her kind. In a science article published in 2015, paleoanthropologist Brian Vilmore and colleagues report the discovery of a partial lower jawbone with teeth from the Leti Gararu research area of Afar, Ethiopia. The LD 350-1 mandible is dated to 2.8 million years old. The possibility that human looking jaw might be erectus or homo sapiens was not even considered because they assumed that modern humans should not have exi existed that long ago. So it was tentatively labeled an indeterminate species of homo. Kenya, we're to the third of our three places, by the way. Extensive, coexisten extensive coexistence of Australopithecus and man at Kubifora. In addition to the many bones and human artifacts discovered by Lewis and Mary Leakey at Olduvai Gorge, their son Richard Leakey discovered a comparable collection of bones and artifacts at the Kubifora Formation in northern Kenya. Although many of the bones and artifacts appear to be human, the radioisotope ages were deemed too old. 2.6 to 2.9 million years old, to belong to humans, and so the dates were revised to a much younger date to conform to the group think, which we'll talk about that later. I'm going to skip over about 18 paragraphs on the story of Col Skull 1470, which uh, belongs as much in radiometric dating as it does in this section. Latest findings confirm coexistence of Australopith and man at Kenya. New discoveries continue to confirm the extensive coexistence of these two genera far deeper into the geologic record than the earliest anatomically human mo uh, modern humans are said to have evolved. For instance, in a Nature publication in 2015, researchers reported the discovery of 3.3 million year old stone tools from the Lomekwe site in Kenya. Prior to this discovery, the oldest stone tools had been dated to 2.6 million years ago, coinciding with the earliest accepted fossil evidence for man. Skipping on a remarkable new discovery in the town of Ilorette, Kenya, within the Kubifora Formation has revealed 97 fossilized footprints produced by tw at least 20 different individuals. Footprints are going all over the place. And their official date is 1.5 million years ago. Skipping on. Conclusions, implications of extensive coexistence. Skipping the first paragraph, almost all of famous hominin sites indicate the extensive coexistence of hominin species claimed to have ancestor descendant relationships. Figure five. How can the ape to man story account for modern looking human bones, human footprints, and human artifacts coexisting with Lucy? After 150 years of collecting and studying hominin fossils, what we actually see is that humans have always coexisted with diverse forms of ape types, including the extinct Australopiths. Unfortunately, when human bones are found too early in the fossil record, such bones are either reclassified, like the Mary Leakey's homo bones and footprints, or redated, like Richard Leakey's 1470 sc uh, skull and stone tools, or are ignored like the Old Hawaii man from Old Hawaii Gorge. And then they come to latest developments in the fall of 2017. In late 2017, new, footprint, new findings of anatomically modern human-looking footprints from Takalos and Western Crete were reported in the Proceedings of the Geologi Geologists Association. The new findings from Crete suggest Homo sapiens erectus lived about at least 5,000 5.7 million years ago, significantly predating the earliest Australopiths. It seems we may be now witnessing the collapse of the modern theory. Well, it's no longer the modern theory, of course. And there's the figure, and you will notice that while you have Australopithecines, you know, Ardea, Africanus, Afarensis, or Lucy, 
Habilis and Boise, well maybe Habilis. Remember that's a mixed taxon probably. You have human remains. First of all, you've, the, all the alternatives are way down here, but as you get further back, you'll notice that there are evidences that go all the way back to the afarensis, and now with our new findings, we have leapfrogged that entire population. My take, the chapter makes a convincing argument that humans predate Australopithecines. Some of the early evidence could be discarded, you know, or reworked or something, but the footprints from Crete stand in spite of the discarding of any other evidence and suggest that the other evidence shouldn't have been discarded or reinterpreted so cavalierly. Remember the Bush theory of human evolution? I think we may be uh, done with this after this week, we will see. The Bush theory of human evolution is okay, but you need to have at least one main stem. Common descent requires that some population or populations had continuous ancestor-descendant relationships between apes and humans. That's what common descent means. We have apes going to humans in the traditional picture, and of course apes staying around because they're still here, or maybe they've evolved a little bit in another direction. The, a more realistic picture is probably with several groups that intermingled and, and um, intermarried, and um, with the apes staying more or less the same and various populations lasting for various periods of time. Then you can have the uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould type of hypothesis that says that we went suddenly from ape to human. And so unless we're very lucky, we won't find the intermediate forms. Um, and finally, you have kind of a double bush kind of thing. Um, Neanderthal, uh, pardon me, without, this one is not compatible with evolution unless there is some kind of connection between these two. Just isn't. Without that connection, that's a creationist hypothesis. Perhaps old age, perhaps young age, but certainly creationist in one sense. Um, we can put Neanderthals way up at the top, or we can put it somewhere along here. We can put Homo erectus at the top, although it almost starts to look like Homo erectus is lasting too long, uh, or starts too early. Or we can put it as part of the bush. We can put um, um, the hobbit as part of a continuation of perhaps uh, something like uh, Homo erectus, or we can put it as another branch of our bush down below. Um, and the same with Naledi. We can take um, Homo habilis and uh, Australopithecus sediba, or sediba, um, and, uh, pardon me, we can, uh, let's uh, back up a little bit. We can put uh, Australopithecus afarensis in that kind of a setting, or we can have it as one of the branches of the Australopithecines. Um, we can put Naledi, or pardon me, uh, we can put, um, um, Lucy's kind, or we can put Ardi down near the base, or down near the base, that will work. We can put uh, Habilis and uh, uh, Australopithecus uh, sediba as mixed bones of two different kinds. Um, and that will again fit on either uh, model. The interesting thing is that there's nothing in the middle that is going to allow us to bring those two together. And uh, what's happened now is we have the bone, the the footprints from Crete, which put us way back here. In fact, we don't even have 
this material here. If I were drawing it correctly, all of uh, Crete should be out here somewhere. And that means that in order for evolution to really answer the question, you have to have something, evolution that's happening before the Crete footprints. Without that, we're back to uh, two separate and unconnected species. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. So all of this controversy. How widespread is the controversy among the so-called experts? Are they all agreed it's controversial and they have to rethink things, or are they still holding out? Well. Sense of that. You will you will find people arguing for their side. Um, you will not necessarily find them conceding that their opponents have any uh, validity. But if you have if you have, uh, and this is not just creationists getting involved. This is actually the evolutionists. If yeah, you have as long people as arguing on both sides. As long as they're saying, well, maybe we need to take some time out here, rethink this, and, yeah, you know, if yeah. they do at least that, that's... But, but you have, yeah, but you have, you know, uh, I disagree with so-and-so. Well, that's a disagreement right there. Um, who's right is not necessarily a, you can't do the decide that on the basis of authority. Um, you're going to have to decide that on the basis of evidence uh, because each authority will claim that the evidence fits, fits their hypothesis better. So, you know, what you really have to do is, uh, well, you either get to choose your best guess is who's the best authority or else you have to look at the evidence for yourself. The ideal thing to do is to look at the evidence for yourself. I think what you can at least walk away with is the idea that um, that either the evidence or some people's theory is not allowing them to uh, become unanimous on this issue. Well, it still points out that your conclusion inter influences your interpretation around the other way around. Well. I mean, your paradigm makes the difference here, so. Yeah, uh, the truth of the matter is for most of us who don't have the training and ability to look at the evidence for ourselves, we don't have much choice but to go and ask, you know, who's the final authority or who's the best authority and go with that either definitively or tentatively. And, you know, for, it, it seems to me that for, <coughs> that in that situation your, your presuppositions do strongly influence your conclusions. I guess the one thing I would say is, if you have people that are looking at a, a, a modern human being buried in supposedly very old sediment, and it's clearly a modern human, nobody disputes that. And you can look at it and it looks modern, you know? Um, and the people who were there at the dig say, no, it, it's, it's perfect. And the people who are not at the dig say no, but it can't be. It must have been a burial of some kind because humans didn't exist that long ago. To me, the empirical people are more reliable in that situation. So is there, um, is there an official paradigm? We'll get to you. Is there an official paradigm and how to 
how does that official paradigm come about and is there a need for an official paradigm? Well, there's a quasi-official paradigm. But it's interesting because the paradigm was there before the evidence came out. Um, and at a certain point you start wondering whether the evidence was fit to the paradigm instead of vice versa. But, but if there is a contention amongst the experts where if, if you go into a room of these people and you say, mm -hmm. okay, my understanding is the official paradigm is, is this story, you know, what do you think about it? Probably they're going to, a, a decent percentage of them, they may not all agree with each other, but, but they'll, a decent percentage will, they will say, well, I agree with this part, but I, you know, I disagree with this part. And you know, there's a lot of disagreement, you know, a lot yeah. of different opinions, you know. Yeah. And yet there's, when, the, when it's reported um, mm -hmm. by sort of popular journalist or, or scientific journalist, I think that they believe that there is sort of some sort of consensus or official paradigm that, and, and that's why they write, oh, this new finding contradicts yeah. what was believed before. Well, what was believed before is, I mean, all sorts <laughs> of things are believed before. Well, actually, we happen to have an expert in this class on that very question. And so we're going to ask her in just a minute. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, th this is a, a rather sobering uh, chapter. I mean, it, uh, the, uh, but it, it, it accentuates something that you notice all the time. There is much more disagreement and contention in the basic scientific literature than you'd surmise. Journalists get hold of this, and it's the it's totally true, or they're so so sure. Or, hey, this new finding, this is right, and so on, uh, and uh, quite a jump between the uh, confidence uh, uh, level, uh, journalists are so sure of themselves and of what they're reporting. And then th this creeps into textbooks and, and uh, then we get into the official story and it's nothing like uh, what uh, these scientists are talking about. And uh, it uh, reemphasizes, you know, and of course, uh, uh, we have a uh, clear point here where, uh, you know, um, data is ignored because of a dominant paradigm uh, type of thing. And uh, when, you, when you have this, you're, you're, you're forced to think, hey, it's so important to get back to the facts. So important to get back to the facts. Uh, but our uh, publicity, our method of communication uh, doesn't do that. And uh, we could cite, of course, a contention that we have now between our various media politically uh, shows you how, how that can happen. And the, the very same thing that happens there is, is ha happens in science. But I thought science was more reliable than politics. I'm beginning, <laughs> I'm beginning to doubt that. <laughs> okay, can we pass the mic back up here? And we're going to allow our expert to speak. Oh, the expert. And you're going to say, too. what are you talking about? No. I'm well, looking for her. I don't, yes. I don't see what where I, she is. What I am going to <laughs> ask you is, what do they teach in fourth grade? Well, we have... Well, I'm in I'm in a Seventh Day Adventist Christian school, so you know <laughs> we don't have the pictures that I grew up with in public school, and the museum, the um, Museum of uh, Natural History in Chicago, where they took us on field trips, have Neanderthal. That was the name that was given. Yeah. And the last time I was at that museum, the name has never changed. Uh, so displays, you know, and he lives in a cave, and he's got the tools, but he looks like an ape, human ape. So is that who the Lucy is? 
Well, Lucy is actually one step or two steps down, depending on down them, who okay. you're listening to. But my question is about the potassium argon. That was mentioned several times as far as dating. Yes. Now, is that controversial, or is that a standard, or? That is currently a standard, and we're going to get into that actually this next week. Yes. Okay. Uh, because, because that's interesting, because it turns out the standard, when it is applied to zero-age specimens, has some difficulties. It's, it's a confusing thing. It's yes. Uh, you know, uh, if you go to the museum, they don't even discuss all of the various ones. They just have Neanderthal and that's it. Which, of course, interbred with anatomically modern humans and therefore is arguably human and therefore is probably the least <coughs> bothersome of all of these supposed intermediates. Uh, what happens is that enough is pulled out so that they can make a story. And if all you need is Neanderthal, that's all you have to pull out. And if all you need is Lucy, then that's what you pull out. Uh, and all of the difficulties of, well, Lucy didn't actually have any feet, and well, did we discover feet of any kind that should be on Lucy? And, you know, all of that kind of stuff just is kind of, like, uh, disappearing here. So, what happens is that if you're, if you're teaching fourth grader, if you're teaching high school biology or something like that, none of these controversies get discussed because at that age, they're trying to inculcate into you that science is sort of unified. And yes, we're, we're reaching on the edges of science and we're constantly pushing back in ignorance, but we never have to go back and correct things that were just known. And we never have to uh, I mean, once a, once a scientific fact, always a, f a scientific fact. Being a scientist means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> you know, um, one thing that troubled me when the new science book came out, which was probably five years ago, is that both sides are not presented. Yes. And so unless we bring in and I was fortunate to find a National Geographic cover that said the latest um, discovery of a human baby, and I'll bring it to class sometime. Um, in the early 2000s, National Geographic had it on the cover. And it, and it was a baby chimpanzee, but it was supposed to be the latest um, artist's conception of the earliest human baby from whatever was ape, I guess, before that. So our children, un unless they're hearing from parents, or in addition to that we're teaching a, crea a creation-based science, are not really being exposed until they're old enough to go, Wow, my parents have really, you know, I've, I've been living in a bubble. It, I don't know. But this no. gentleman has something. May I speak? Go ahead. Um, I looked up this cladogenesis uh -huh. and anogenesis. Yeah. Or anogenesis. And uh -huh. the. the to determine whether a uh, speciation event is cladogenesis or anagenesis, research, researchers may use 
simulation evidence. Simulation. Well, that's what they're doing with this whole, uh, excuse me, global warming hoax. Yes, you yes. Know, putting the uh, computers to simulate the input they've already put in there. Yeah. So this, when did these terms come out? Is it, you know, sometimes they just slip them in where they need them and... Well, it sort of reminds you of, um, of uh, homoplasy and uh, homology. Uh, or homology. Homology is things that look alike because they're inherited from the previous uh, ancestor. Homoplasy is things that look alike but they weren't inherited from the previous ancestor. Well how do you know which is which? Well you don't until you know whether they had a previous ancestor or not. Or the, whether the previous ancestor had this had the feature. Yeah. And so you see if 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 sharks and dolphins are streamlined, that's homoplasy because the intermediate ancestor of dolphins didn't have that kind of streamlining. But if let's say sharks and bony fish are streamlined, that's because they inherited it from a common ancestor. So the, the very terms are basically loaded with evolutionary theory. And the people believe evolutionary theory like it was the theory of gravity. And they'll say so. And of course they expect you to believe it like it was the theory of gravity. Um, Uh, and, and so for them, it's not being intellectually dishonest because that's just the way things happen. Uh, but if they're asking you to change your beliefs to match theirs, I think it is fair to question uh, why, you know, how do you tell homology from, uh, or homology from homoplasy? Well, you don't. Different species from one. Different right, species. right. Well, you know, the. Uh, how do you tell lateral gene transfer from all of that? How do you tell, shall we call it, facilitated lateral gene transfer from all of that? Well, the, it's real easy because there is no such thing as facilitated lateral gene transfer. So, you, you know, you have, you have bats and you have. Uh, whales that have the uh, dolphins that have the exact same protein for listening because they're both dealing with ultrasound and having to make very clear distinctions. And so, you know, that's obviously lateral gene transfer. Well, no, it couldn't be that because bats and whales don't live in the same environment. So it must have been uh, maybe a, drown, uh, a whale ate a drowned bat or something and <laughs> had, its, had its RNA or in, reincorporated into DNA. And, and I, you know, the more you, the more you think about that, the more difficult it gets and people are not dealing with those difficult questions because if you have to deal with those difficult questions, you start asking questions like, why are we doing this at all? Maybe there was a common designer. You know? And that's the question, that's the precise question they don't want people to ask. Yeah. It um, seems to me that one of the factors that we need to emphasize more in a reference to our textbooks and so on. The limitations of science. We don't talk about that very much. The limit, this, is, uh, this is extremely important in, a, in a, uh, an environment where science is, is held up as the final authority of everything. Uh, we need to move more in that direction. This, this chapter gives an excellent example of, of what happens in science. 
Yeah, sometime we should revisit the entire article of Lewontin and his comments on uh, Carl Sagan's uh, um, book because uh, billions and billions yeah. of demons. That is so revelatory to mm -hmm. the paradigm mm -hmm. shift from science as being defined by the scientific method and uh, being basically the study of the reproducible to science as as the begetter of all knowledge and not allowing the divine foot in the door. There is a new article that came out this week. It's called The Shape of Life. It's in the American Scientist, written by a Harvard history uh, professor. And it's discussing the stromatolite issue and so on. And uh, the conclusion of the article is nothing visibly distinguishes the vital from the non-vital. You're not going to be able to see it, folks. When looking for ancient life, you don't have to see the evidence anymore. Simply put, the search for ancient life is no longer a search for ancient life forms. Uh, they've moved from fact into, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, societal, societal agreement, uh, psychology maybe. Uh, I don't know what the term is, but we've all known for years that this uh, stromatolite thing is, it goes into the whole history of this thing. Uh -huh. uh, very, very interesting article. And, uh, well, uh, and so now all you have to do is find layers. You don't have to find cells or anything like that. No evidence of life. They say, well, there's no evidence of life in the present ones either. Uh, and that's true. And, uh, but that's a, a total argument from silence. Uh, just because <laughs> you can't uh, see something doesn't mean that it's something else. Uh, this, uh, so, uh, but I, you know, I really think uh, emphasis on the limitation of science is strongly demanded because it's, it's yeah, I think so it's, too, and I think misleading so many people. It's better to say I don't know when the evidence is not uh, completely there, and. It is better for those science sects to acquaint the little kids with the idea that there's something scientists just don't know. And in fact, but see the problem is that if you do that, how are you going to convince them of evolution? Especially the ones that have parents that taught them real things. Part of the problem is that elementary teachers are trained in, in a different way than, than scientists are when they're going to college. The, the, it, it's what, I, what I see that's happening, and in, in my own family, is that they're brought up as creationists, and then maybe depending on one or two teachers in, in academy, there's another little different input. Their world is expanding. But then they go to college. And the professors of college have been trained maybe as in science or archaeology or paleontology or whatever. And they're, they're the experts. And that's, that's where, and that's the age when you're questioning lots of things. Um, I don't know. Ken Ham says, by the time they're 10, we've lost them. If we haven't strong educationism. Yeah. I mean, it's written a book already gone. Yeah. Oh, it was, I have that book. Yes, that is correct. Well, actually, that's fourth grade. Yeah. That's H10, that's your guys. Or was your guys. Yeah. And, and, and what that means is we need to start at age 10 or earlier. 
it's not enough to just teach them the stories. We need to teach them that there is a controversy. We need to introduce them to at least parts of it. And we need to introduce them to the, the arguments and the fact that those arguments are not always based on fact. Um, that some of those arguments are based on whose philosophy you believe. Uh, what, come on. Sure. Uh, you presented, and we mentioned it before already, this 5.7 million years yeah. for the footprint. And I guess you're going to go into the whole question of uh, measuring dim distant past timetables, and I yes. will not be here next week. So give me a clue. Are you going to suggest that the 5.7 will scientifically be corrected? In other words, the methodology will be changed. Or will they come up with the usual story, contamination? Well, um, the 5.7 is based on an event that happened in the Mediterranean where a good share of it dried up. Exactly how much we don't know because nobody has gone all the way down to the bottom of the Mediterranean and dug into it. There's some problems with breathing down there. Um, uh, but, but that there are deposits that look like most of the Mediterranean dried up and, and, and gave um, certain kinds of micro deposits in the rest of the land is true. Now, when did that happen? Well, that's done by radiometric dating. But the layer where everything was dried up was above the layer where the footprints were found. And so you can argue that it's really 5.8 if you want to. But what you can't do is argue that it's 4.2 <laughs> unless you don't believe radiometric dating. And if you don't believe radiometric dating, then this whole thing falls apart. And, and uh, one of the things we're going to find out is that uh, specimens that should date zero because they flowed in 1910 or 1852 and we, well maybe not we, but our forebears actually watched it and wrote down what year it was. Uh, that those deposits can date literally to millions of years. In some cases as high as 40 million years by potassium argon. <laughs> now we haven't done quite the same thing by, by argon argon. Um, but argon argon is actually a variant of potassium argon that's more resistant to resetting in which case there's no particular reason to not to believe that the argon-argon dates would be even higher. And if you date zero stuff to that, then who's to say that you can't date 5,000 year old stuff to 40 million years? In which case, uh, this 5.7 million years for the drying up of the Mediterranean is an estimate using a method that's known to have problems with zero age. And so, you know, if you want to argue that it's 5,000 years, you're within your rights to do so. Five thousand five hundred, four thousand three hundred. 4,300, you know, Whatever. Yeah, the other thing I was pondering is we seem to be, as humans, want to be one extreme or the other or a third or a fourth or a fifth dimension. We don't seem to celebrate skepticism. And they probably, instead of having a humanist society, we ought to have, and there probably is a skeptic society. 
There is a skeptical but it society, but they're skeptical of everything except one thing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, even even a, a Bible believing Christian should be skeptical about his own interpretation of what he thinks he reads. And uh, I'm just picked up this morning, you know, the uh, an excerpt from the book of um, Enoch. And my, does that um, blow your mind? <laughs> Well, um, I think with that we'll probably close and uh, come back next week and have some fun with uh, radiometric dating.